Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Entrepreneur Mind Speak. I'm Lauren with Creme de Mint, a branding and packaging design agency. And today we would like to welcome Victor Olshansky, uh, a founder and CEO of Zyami Distillery located in Hollywood, Florida. And today he will be sharing with us valuable insights on how to start your own alcohol or energy line drink. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, uh, so I, I plan to do about a 20-minute uh, a presentation here, and then we're going to have lots of time for your questions. Okay, so creating an alcohol brand. When I entered this industry, I, I set out to launch my own brand. Um, so, you know, I had the experience trying to create and grow a brand in the marketplace, uh, although at this point in time, we're 100% focused on manufacturing and bottling other people's brands. So, so I'm going to touch on a lot of aspects here. Uh, and a lot of what I'm covering is applicable not only to alcohol beverages, uh, but uh, also to other private label or um, uh, contract produced beverage products. And uh, our specific expertise here at Ziami includes uh, energy drinks, uh, CBD or, or cannabis based um, uh, ready to drink products and and uh, also some alternative products like Kratom and Kava. So so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on all of the above. Once you get into the alcohol industry, there's a lot of regulation. It does get very complicated uh, and, and tough to cover everything in 20 minutes, but I want to give you enough to, to get started and decide where you want to go from here. All right, so start with your marketing plan. Uh, we, we talk to a lot of people who come in, have a concept to start a brand. And it's very important when I communicate with people that I, I make sure you're starting at the right end of the problem. Uh, the US market has a ton of products out there that are horrible, but they sell. They sell because they're well-marketed, because they've got the right celebrity spokesperson, because they have a big marketing budget pushing them. There's a lot of really good products that never make it to the store shelves because they don't have the right marketing plan or strategy. So, so you really need to start here and then work backwards to your actual product development. Um, make sure you identify your target audience. I, I don't want to give you a whole lesson here on marketing, but identifying your target audience is very important. Try to focus in on a more narrow segment of the market. Uh, you, you can't be all things to all people. People have different tastes and preferences. Uh, and also the more narrow you're able to focus your target audience, uh, the easier it's going to be to develop the right messaging and uh, kind of apply your uh, marketing resources to hit that target. Uh, some things to think about here. Is there an unmet need in the market uh, that, that I can accomplish with my product? Is there something out there already that I can do better? And what's your value proposition? You know, how, how, does my product deliver value to my target audience? How are you going to communicate this to that target audience to make sure they actually buy your product? Uh, retail price, very, very important. If you don't think about this up front, then you'll never be able to make the numbers work with your production costs to get there. Um, I've got another slide towards the end. I, I'm going to break down kind of distributor margins, retail margins, and, and how you could work back from your retail price to your uh, production cost and, and see if it makes sense. But you got to think about what's a realistic price for your product that your target market is, is, is willing to spend. Uh, what's the geography? For your launch. Okay, this is kind of a, a, a multi-pronged question here. 
you've got your target geography for your initial launch. And then assuming, you know, you, you plan to grow your brand at some point, how are you going to grow it geographically and over what kind of timeline? And marketing budget. Uh, I, I'd say if you're launching an alcohol brand, just starting point for marketing budget, you, you probably need to be looking at uh, $100,000 for your first year. You know, if you really want to be able to, to push this and make it work, you know, you're probably looking at more like a, a $500,000 budget over, you know, 18 to 24 months and, you know, being very strategic about how you allocate that, where you allocate it, um, you know, how much you put towards in-store tastings versus social media versus, you know, other aspects of the marketing plan. But if, if you're not prepared to, to make a significant investment in the marketing, it, it's, it's not really worth going into the product development uh, because you, it, it's an extremely competitive industry and, and, and you got to have that strategy together first. Um, so a little bit about how sales work in the alcohol industry, uh, in the U S so we have something in the U S we refer to as the three tier system. It kind of dates back to the repeal of prohibition in 1933. Uh, when prohibition was repealed, the 21st amendment authorized each state to regulate the sale and use of alcohol within its own borders. Uh, and what's that, what that's created is there's really 50 separate sets of rules about how you sell alcohol in the US. And it's all state by state. Um, we do have a federal regulatory authority, which does exert a lot of control on uh, how alcohol is licensed and, uh, you know, how products and labels are standardized. But there's very specific and very different rules in each individual state uh, based on, on how it's sold in that state. Um, one thing that's fairly common across all but 17 states is this three-tier system where you have the producer, that, that, that would be your co-packer or yourself if you have your own uh, distillery, winery, brewery. Uh, you've got a distributor or wholesaler who's the second tier. And then you have the retailer, which would be either a liquor store, grocery, or a restaurant. Uh, and uh, the way these rules are set up is no member no member in any specific tier can own a member of the other tier. So the producer, the distributor, and the retailer are all independent businesses. And in order to work through the system, you cannot cut out the distributor. Uh, so um, part of understanding how you're going to get your product to market is identifying what distributor you're gonna work with in each state and uh, making sure that that distributor is willing to accept your product and uh, sell it to the retailers in the state. There's limited exceptions to that, but generally speaking, you have to go through this three-tier system. Uh, now I said this is all but 17 states. There's 17 states that are referred to as control states, where the state itself acts as the distributor and retailer and retains control over alcohol sales. Uh, that includes states like Virginia, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Wyoming. Uh, so um, those states work a little bit differently and there, if, if you want to sell your product in that state, you are actually selling the product to the state itself. Uh, when we talk about distributors, uh, there's 
there's two general groups of distributors. Uh, traditional distributors include companies like Southern Wine and Spirits, uh, Republic National Distribution Company, uh, Empire di uh, Distribution. Those companies will purchase the product from the producer. Uh, they'll mark it up or, or at a margin, and then we'll sell the product to the retail. Uh, those traditional distributors tend to work only with large established brands. Uh, it's very difficult to start uh, working with them if you're a small startup. Uh, the workaround is if you have someone on your team who's a, uh, an industry veteran, or you're working with a consultant uh, who has a lot of experience in the industry and can kind of get you through the door and, you know, paint a convincing story with a distributor that, you know, there's, there's money behind your brand, you got a sound marketing plan, it's going to move. Uh, the alternative for a lot of startups is what I refer to as the consignment distributors. Um, this includes some groups like uh, Park Street or MHW. Uh, here in Florida, we, we have some other uh, smaller organizations uh, that, that also work in this area. Uh, and the way they work is uh, the distributor basically provides uh, warehousing and logistics services, uh, as well as delivery and invoicing with the retailers. But in generally speaking, the distributor does not pay you until they get paid by the retailer. Uh, so, so it's really like a consignment sale. Uh, a lot of times it's structured in such a way that uh, you know, most states don't really allow consignment sales. Uh, so, so there's some workarounds there, but, but for practical purposes, uh, it, it, it's like a consignment. So you, you, you can work with these distributors, no matter how big or small you are, but you're not going to get, you're going to be paying them each month for storage and delivery, and you will only get paid for your product after it's sold to a retailer. Um, real quick, franchise states versus open states. Uh, some states have rules that uh, basically grant, once you sign an agreement with a distributor, you're tied to that distributor within a specified territory for life. It's, it's like a marriage. Um, and the only way you could switch to a different distributor is if the distributor agrees to release you. Uh, and, and, and usually they could ask you to pay a, a breakup fee to do that. Uh, open states are a little more favorable to uh, the brand owners. And, and there it's, it's really just an agreement between you and the distributor uh, where the distributor is going to distribute your product. And if you're not happy with the way things are going, you can switch to a different distributor. Uh, that differs from state to state. Uh, so like in Florida, Florida for liquor, it's an open state, but for beer, it's a franchise state. Georgia is a franchise state for everything. So, so if you're selling in Georgia, you, you better, once you sign an agreement with a distributor, you better make sure it's the distributor you want because you're not gonna be able to leave that distributor. Uh, tide house rules, that, that, that's just another term for the rules that say a producer can't own a distributor and a distributor can't own a retail. Direct to consumer, direct shipping. A lot of this is available in the wine industry, but for spirits, uh, there's very, very limited states right now that are actually allowing direct-to-consumer shipping. There are ways to make it look like you're doing direct-to-consumer through some web front-end platforms that, that look like people are, are able to purchase direct. But 
it's really just a, a disguise for this three-tier system. Uh, so if you think, hey, my solution, my value proposition is I got this great product and I'm going to sell direct to consumer. I'm going to cut out the, the liquor stores and the, the distributors. Sorry, you can't really do it in the U.S. yet. You can make it look like you're doing it, but that product is still got to go through a distributor warehouse. It's still got to go through a licensed retailer. And even if they're only touching it for five minutes, I guarantee you they're going to put a 30% markup on it anyway, because they can't. So, so you can make it look like direct to consumer, but it's not saving you any cost in the equation. So you've got federal issues and you've got state issues. Uh, on the federal side, first off, do I need a license? If you're an independent brand owner and you don't, you don't have a physical distillery or brewery, you know, or warehouse, the short answer is you don't actually need a license. For practical purposes, everything's going through a licensed producer, a licensed wholesaler, and a licensed retailer. All you really own is the intellectual property. Arguments have been made that if you're profiting, you know, financially from an alcohol product, then technically you should have a federal basic wholesale permit. So be, because you're, you're getting money from the sale of alcohol, you should have, you're, you're basically a wholesaler in the eyes of the federal government. You want to cover all your bases. You can apply for a federal basic wholesale permit. You could do it through ttbonline.gov. It's free. There's no cost associated. You got to do a lot of paperwork. It takes a couple of months for the processing to complete, but it is free. It's really just a question of your time. Once you're actually, you know, doing transactions in the industry, if you get in with some of the bigger distributors, some of them may insist that if they're writing a check to your company, that your company holds a, a basic permit. So, so if you do that up front, you're setting yourself up for success in the long run. But you don't really need to do that to get started in the alcohol industry. Uh, some of the other federal issues, formula label registration. Basic spirits like vodka, rum, bourbon don't require a formula. But if you're using any added flavors, colors, uh, if you're, you're making a, a ready-to-drink cocktail, even if all you're adding is carbonation, it requires a formula, and that formula needs to be registered with the federal authority, the, uh, the Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau, or the TTB. In most cases, your label must also be registered and approved. Now, I say most cases. If, you're, if your product uses distilled spirits, then the label has to be approved in all cases, you know, even if it's straight by. If you're using a beer, malt, uh, or wine less than 7%, like, like a, uh, a low alcohol carbonated wine product, you don't need the label uh, approved in advance but you still have to file that formula. And as far as registering these formulas and labels, it, they have to be tied to a producer's or an importer's federal license. Unless you're doing this in your own distillery, the responsibility for registering the, the label and, and the formula is gonna be with your co-pack. So if you're producing at my facility, I'm the one that needs to register the formula and the label. It's very important if you're trying to lean forward on actually launching your brand and you want to get labels printed or you want to get cans printed, do not get anything printed 
until that label is approved. Because I'd say two out of three times, there's some small corrections required. And if you already went ahead and printed those labels, you're just going to have to throw them in the garbage and print them again. So very important, you know, work together with your co-packer. Uh, make sure you, you get those approvals before you print it. On the state side, every state is different. And this isn't just for the state where you're producing. This is for the state where you're selling. Okay, so you can produce something in Florida and sell it anywhere in the U.S., but to be able to sell in that state, you need to conform to the requirements of that state where you're selling the product. Some states are very simple. New Jersey, all you have to do, I think, is uh, register the label. It's free, and then just ship your product. You're good to go. Other states, like Georgia, require that you have a local representative in the state. Uh, there, there's agencies you could hire that you know will, will, will just like act in that capacity, but you need a local rep in that state. Georgia requires you to get a, an indemnity bond for Georgia taxes. Uh, they require a corporate registration and they require that you designate a distributor for every territory in that state. And they also require that you register all your labels in that state. As you're working back from your marketing plan and say, hey, I want, I want to start out in Florida, but then I want to expand into Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, you know, for, for you know, year two. You need to understand those specific rules in those states you're looking at. Don't just assume you could do that. Like, hey, I got a distributor in Georgia now. You know, next month we're shipping to Georgia. Yeah. In some of these states, it's like a three to four month process to get all those approvals done before you could actually start selling product in that state. One way to streamline this is working with a third party compliance manager. Uh, these are groups like Park Street, MHW, or American Spirits Exchange. But the way a lot of them operate is you ship everything to one of their warehouses, and then they actually use their own licenses to ship it out to different states. It's a good way to manage a larger scale like national distribution program. At small scale, it could be very expensive because they charge high monthly minimum fees that if you're not if you're not shipping a significant volume into multiple states every single month, that minimum fee is just gonna gonna kill you right off the bat. This is mostly on alcohol. If you're looking to do something with cannabis, Kratom, or other alternative products. Those have very different regulations, which also differ from state to state. It's incumbent upon you as the brand owner, as a brand developer, to acquaint yourself with those re regulations to know what you can and can't do. You know, cannabis, there's a lot of stuff we could do here in Florida, but the minute we try to ship it out of Florida, raises a whole bunch of other issues. The Kratom, also very interesting right now. It's a kind of a, a growth niche. Um, it's legal in most states in the US. It's legal to ship across state lines, but it's completely illegal in Alabama. So you wanna do something with, with Kratom? We could do a lot with you on a national scale. Just don't tell us to send it to Alabama. Know what you're getting into. Do wanna to touch on you know, product development, and then I'll open it up to questions. So I'm gonna hit formulation, package design, uh, and, and then some other key things to think about when selecting your co-pack. Uh, formulation, uh, this is, you know, what is the liquid I actually wanna make and, and how do I wanna make it? If you're just doing straight vodka or you want, you know, vodka with a special kind of finish, that's pretty straightforward. 
If you're looking to do a specialty flavored product that gets a little more complicated and you're gonna to need to think through, how am I gonna formulate this? Am I gonna work, what kind of professional am I gonna work with to, you know, to do this right? You always need to keep in the back of your mind, how much is, how much is this gonna cost at scale in production? Because if you're not thinking about that, you're, you're not going about this the right way. You could say, hey, I wanna do an all organic product with all natural juice, natural color, natural, natural, natural. Okay. But when you actually look, start working through how much it's gonna to cost to produce and the production process, that's going to actually make it shelf stable so that six months from now, you don't have exploding cans, you know, that are putrid and rotting and making people sick. You're gonna have some challenges. What marketing claims do you wanna make that are non-negotiable? You know, things like all natural, zero calorie, certified, USDA certified organic. What kinds of things are, are those that, hey, I can't do my brand if it's not gonna be certified organic? Or, you know, what are some areas that, yeah, you know, I'd like it to be certified organic, but that's not going to make or break whether my target consumer buys it. You know, and if I could do it for a fraction of the cost without being certified organic, then why not? These are things you should discuss with your formula developer up front. Okay. There's a, a, a lot of people out there that, that you say, hey, I want this, 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 and this. They'll give it to you. But then when you go try to find a co-packer and say, hey, I got a formula. You know, we're, we're, we're using, uh, you know, natural coconut water and, you know, no preservatives and this, that, and the other thing. And, and uh, my formulator said, yeah, it, it's all good. We, we just need to make sure that Everything stays frozen until the point of sale, blah, blah, blah. And your co-packer is going to be like, well, they'll either say, I can't do that. Or they'll say, well, we could do that, but instead of costing you, you know, $2 a can, it's going to be $10 a can. So the, the way to head that off is to, to have these conversations up front with whoever is formulating your product. And then you want to know, are you going to own that formula? Or is this person or this group you contracted with to develop the product, is it going to be proprietary to them? And the only way you can replicate that formula is if you hire them to do all your manufacturing. Typically, if it's someone that's going to let you own your formula, there's probably going to be a significant upfront fee associated with it. If you're talking to someone and they're like, no, you know, I'm not going to charge you anything for, for the, the formula design. You, you just need to do your production with me. Well, well, that's great. You know, may save your costs up front. But if you run into problems with production later or you want to, you know, you want to renegotiate the production cost, you're incredibly successful in growing and growing and you, you need to find someone else who can you know, meet your, your new production needs, you may not be able to get that formula back from that group at that time. Package design. I, I think, think this is kind of falls into Lauren's lane a lot here. You should balance your wants against the economic realities. You may want to have a unique, super custom bottle that no one else has. The minimum quantity you might need to, to get that bottle made might be a hundred thousand bottles. And you know, your 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 budget just doesn't support that. Or, you know, it, it's going to take you 10 years to sell a hundred thousand of those bottles. And it's not worth it. Maybe that bottle requires some specialized filling process that no one out there is able to do for you unless they buy a custom machine just to fill that. So one, one good approach here starting out is to look at working with some stock items, stock designs, 
uh, you know, more common bottle shapes. But think about how you could take that stock design and give it a custom look. Uh, and, and, and that's a conversation between you and your designer, whoever's designing your label or, or designing the, the end look of the product. You need to give some consideration to minimum order quantities with different suppliers here. Okay, more more common shapes or, or items, you know, like a, a standard 12 ounce can. You can buy those cans in smaller quantities because they're readily available. There's also multiple suppliers out there with same or, or very similar items. Uh, so that's going to reduce your cost and give you more flexibility in, in obtaining those items. More standardized traditional package types are more compatible with the equipment that uh, a lot of people like like my shop or, or other co-packers are going to have. You know, if you're thinking, hey, I really want to do something a little more custom longer term, well, well, great. Think about a transition point where, you know, after you hit a certain point in your growth, you can transition to a more customized package type. But instead of doing it right at your launch, you know, plan to do it at some milestone down the road when you actually have some money in the bank or, or you could attract the right investors to make that work. Barcodes, I, I just want to emphasize very quickly, buy your own barcodes from GS1. GS1 is the barcode authority in the United States. There's a lot of uh, resellers that will, you know, will, will try to sell you barcodes cheaper. The problem is uh, if you try to get your product in with some bigger retailers like Walmart, for example, um, they will check to make sure your barcodes are actually registered to your business and that they check out. And the only way to do that and ensure that is to buy them directly from GS1. Uh, so please consider that up front. Uh, it's not a big investment. Two basic types of barcodes. Uh, you'll, you'll see the one without the box around it. That's, that's a standard UPCA type barcode. That's the type of barcode you're, you're gonna wanna have on the individual products that can be scanned at a cash register. Uh, so individual bar bottles should have that UPCA. If you're selling something in a four pack, four pack that's going to be scanned at the register, that should also have a UPCA. The barcode with a big box around it, that's called an ITF-14 or an SCC uh, case code. That's the barcode you're gonna to wanna to put on secondary packaging that's only gonna be scanned in a warehouse somewhere. And uh, real quickly, working with co-packers and suppliers. Uh, when we say co-packer, we're, we're basically talking about a bottler um, or, or someone who's going to produce and, and package your product on your behalf. Uh, Co-packers are a type of supplier, but some other suppliers that you'll, you'll be dealing with are suppliers of your packaging, suppliers of your ingredients, um, uh, suppliers of other, other components. Uh, it, it's possible that you may want to purchase some rum directly from uh, you know, a, a broker who deals with Dominican rum, uh, but you want to have it bottled in Florida or, or bottled in Georgia. Uh, you know, that, that might, that broker of the, this, the base spirit could be another vendor you're working with, but your co-packer happens to be the place in Florida or Georgia where you're actually putting it in a bottle. Uh, these are two different types of relationships. Uh, and I think you, you need to think about them a little bit differently. Uh, your co-packer 
you should really think of more as a business partner. You guys really need to work together to make your brand successful. Uh, that that co-packer is also going to have to handle these label registrations, the formula registrations. They're going to be dealing with uh, short-term storage and logistics on your behalf. So it's not just a okay, you know, who's got the best price? That's who I'm going with. Uh, you, you really need to think through some of these other aspects of the relationship. Uh, your other vendors, on the other hand, it, it really depends on, on what you're purchasing. If you're purchasing glass and, and it's a stock design, well, it, you know, you, if you've got three vendors selling the same kind of bottle, it, then, okay, you know, who's got the best price, right? Um, and, and you may not be tied to that vendor, you know, for every single purchase, when you're talking with co-packers, you want to take into consideration, you know, what are their capabilities? What are their limitations? And, and what's their focus area? Co-packers that do very large volume production are not the same type of co-packers that are going to do, you know, a couple thousand bottles for a new brand launch. Depending where you are in, in your life cycle, you know, it should kind of guide you on, on, on who you're looking for. Oftentimes, even if you, you find one of these bigger groups that might be willing to do a smaller run, they may not give, give you the level of attention you need for where you are in your life cycle. Uh, quality control and quality insurance. These vary with the scale of the co-packer. Anyone you're working with in this industry, you know, with a, a, a food and beverage product should have some pretty strict quality control measures in place to make sure that you're getting a consistent product from batch to batch and that uh, it, it's not going to make anyone sick. This is an example pricing model that, that I just want to throw up here so you understand how much margin goes to the distributors and retailers in this industry. And if you're not thinking through your cost structure with these factors in mind, you, you're not going to calculate your profit correctly or your profit expectations. This, this is an example of, uh, let, let's call it a, uh, an 80 proof vodka in a, a 750 milliliter bottle. Okay, that has a retail price of $28.88 a bottle. Okay, in this scenario, your hard costs of production as, as the brand owner are $8 a bottle. Okay, and, and this, this is kind of inclusive of the cost of the glass, the liquid inside, the co packing fees, and everything. All right, so. Uh, it's costing you eight bottles to produce. It's selling retail at $28.88. Okay. In order to support this retail price, okay, the distributor is selling that bottle to the retailer at $20.19. Okay. The retailer is taking a 30% margin you know, on this transaction, that's, that, that's pretty common here in Florida. Um, and then the distributor is also taking a 30% margin, but built into the distributor's price of $20.19 is uh, a Florida state excise tax. Uh, th this is per, this is on a case of, of 12 bottles. So it's, Fifteen forty-five per case, and you know three dollars per case uh, to to pick up the product from the copack. You, as the the supplier, you need to to figure out well, you know how much am I going to sell this bottle to the distributor uh, so I actually make some profit. Again, we're, we're talking like a this is a a twelve pack case, so. So 
your cost, eight times 12 is $96 uh, for the case. If you say you, you're going to make $55 profit on that case, you need to sell that case to the distributor at $151. Okay, distributors paying three bucks in logistics to pick it up. They're paying $15.45 in state taxes. The distributor's landed cost is $169 on that case. After they add a 30% margin on their end, you know, which is, is like $72.80 profit for the distributor, he's selling that case for $242.32 to the retailer. So, so here, this is, so this 2888 bottle, I'm sorry, I didn't break everything out by, by bottle here. Um, yeah, so 2888 is our retail price. It's costing us $8 to manufacture. We're making on a per bottle basis, you're making $4.58 a bottle. And we didn't even talk about, you know, what are your marketing costs to get this sold? Okay, this is just on hard costs. So this number here, you got to figure, all right, I, I'm going to have marketing expenses. I'm going to have other sales, sales and business expenses. I'm going to have overhead. So what does this number need to be, you know, that, that I'm going to be able to cover that? I'll share these slides with you later. You can play around with them. Uh, but just everything in here, you know, is between the distributor and the retail. You know, that's $8 to $28.88. It's a big spread. Just know you're a tiny piece of that. Your actual profit here is $4.58 a bottle. The rest, is going to the distributor and the retailer and taxes. That, that's, that's the alcohol industry. All right, I've got some more slides on the end here that, that you could review later about our company. We do spirits, wine-based products and non-alcoholic products. And we're in Hollywood, Florida, but I definitely wanna let you guys ask whatever questions you have and I'll do my best to answer them. Great. Thank you so much for that very informative presentation, Victor. Uh, we have a question from Lauren. Lauren, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello. I'm more interested in um, branding a wine. So what would be my best route to find a co-packer for that? Because I want to create a wine with a producer. I, so if it's if it's a a more traditional wine, uh, I'd suggest uh, reaching out to some wineries directly, um, or uh, you know some wine bottlers directly, uh, because the you know the, the more more middlemen you can cut out of the process, generally speaking, uh, you know the more more efficient your cost structure is going to be. Um, so I would, would it say, be, would it be better to, to, um, reach out to wineries within my area or. Oh, what is your area, Lauren? I'm in Missouri. You're in Missouri. Um, I'm not too familiar with Missouri wineries, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or, you know, how, how many there are, mm -hmm. um, certainly if if you've got some relationships with any, that would be a good place to start. Um, you know, obviously the West Coast is going to have a lot more options uh, as far as just wineries of all different scale with, with access to different products. Um, the, the interesting thing with, with wine, uh, you know, I could, could say the same about 
you know, certain spirits like, like aged rums or, or bourbons is uh, it could be as much about the blending as it is about the specific, you know, varietal or vintage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, finding a specific vineyard may be less important than finding a good blender, you know, or a good uh, wine processor and, and just have a conversation with them about what it is you're trying to achieve and uh, if they can accomplish that for you. I was really wanting to go South Africa with those wineries, um, but I was concerned about the shipping and uh, distribution of it. Yeah, so there's there, there's a couple routes you could go, and uh, I would I would start the conversation with one of your local wineries. Uh, okay. Because it, it's possible to import bulk wine um, and, you know, and, and then bottle it in the U.S. Okay. Uh, we, we actually do that a lot on the spirit side as well. But uh, because the wine's a little bit different, it, just in terms of, you know, how it keeps over time and, and the stability. Yeah. Uh, if you really want to have a, a truly South African product, mm -hmm. you may want to bring it in already bottled from South Africa. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Allison. Allison, do you want to mute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Lauren. Hi, I'm Allie Hickson. Victor, I just want to tell you your presentation was fabulous. I think um, your points really hit on all these things that have been running around in my head, but more importantly, it let me know you, um, as I think Bogdan mentioned, you really know your stuff. That said, I have a question. I have a boutique sangria, and you mentioned in the formula portion of your presentation that, and forgive me, because I don't know, I'm, I'm going to try to be as specific as possible, but from my recollection of what you said, um, you don't own the formula depending on what the relationship you establish with the distillery. Is it the distillery or? Um, well, well it, it's really the, the relationship with the formulation group, whoever, did, whoever created the formula for you. Obviously, if you create the formula yourself, it's, right. it's yours. But, um, you know, if you contract with a flavor house or an independent formulator, then you know, that's something you need to work out with them up front, you know, and under the, the, the terms of your, uh, your engagement, uh, you know, if, if you retain rights to, to the finished formula or not. That, that makes sense. See, I misunderstood that because I did create this formula. It's been in my family for over 20 years or so, and it's, it's, I can't keep it in the house. And um, my challenge has been uh, basically you know, stepping out into the world and saying, we're going to do this and, and seeing the kind of uh, la uh, landscape that you put out, but more importantly, finding the trust to uh, be able to give the formula and, and secure that if I moved on to somewhere else, would it be protected? So what I'm getting from you is that if I were to share my formula and basically work out with the distillery, a comparable, um, let's just say comparable ingredients that work to achieve the taste that I'm looking for, it still would be owned by myself. Is that correct? It, it again, it, it's it's a question of what agreement you you come to with the distillery. So I I do want to highlight here that you know this is a, a homegrown you know type of formula, and I you know I don't know what ingredients you're using. Um, it, is my screen still being shared or, or no? Yeah, uh, no, it's you, just you. Uh, uh, let me pull this up again. Um, just to come back to, to this slide.
Okay, so uh, it's a highlighter. Here we go. So a, a, a cu couple considerations here are uh, ease of manufacture and scalability. So, mm -hmm. you know, if these are, if we're talking like fresh grape juice or other fresh ingredients are in this formula, to, to really move this into a commercial product, we're probably going to want to replace some of those ingredients with some stabilized flavor compounds uh, from a flavor house. Okay. Uh, and, um, also, you know, any, any specific additives or special flavors we're adding are also going to need to be TTB approved or have some sort of spec sheet that's submitted along with that formula when it's registered to the TTB. And, uh, you know, what we're looking here is to, to make sure that the commercial version of the product has a consistent flavor you know, and shelf life, whether someone's drinking it two months from now or 18 months from now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there may be some changes in the formulation to get there. Uh, and and you, you do want to retain rights to that final formula, especially if you decide at a point you want to switch from one co-packer to another co-packer, you want to be able to take that formula with you without you know, trying to recreate it from scratch. So, so that's something you'd, you'd want to have in writing in a formal ingredient, uh, as formal agreement with the co-packer, you know, or the, the formula person at the time that you do that conversion, uh, just to, to make sure that you're protected. That, that, that makes complete sense to me. I, um, just so you know, I, I, we started making this over 20 years ago, like I said. And so what, when I made it, you know, it's very much a, a love of everyone that, you know, comes to events and different things, but we, I put just to test it, I put, um, you know, I, I had it bottled and put in for 10 years and I recently opened a 10 year bottle and it was better than the first time. So not saying that I know that, you know, what I, I know what I've done, but what you're saying is the commercial blend of it would have to withstand that type of rigor, correct? Yes. And, and th 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 this is one of the conversations that y'all, you'll need to have with the right co-packer too, is it, there's, there may be some other cost factors associated with the formulation that, you know, at scale, obviously, you, you want to have the highest quality product right. at the lowest production cost you could you could do, right? Right. Um, and be able to re replicate it batch after batch after batch. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's part of you know the skill of of an ex experienced be beverage industry person to help you move from you know your your home formula to that commercially viable formula. Understood. And does your company do that? Uh, we do. We, okay. we do. That, that is a service we provide. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your time. And again, Lauren, thank you for putting this together. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Tanya has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Um, say if I have spoken to um, various wineries and they aren't willing to share, you know, the uh, producer or distributor, where can I find, I guess, that information? Um, are you talking for your own product or for an existing product that you're, you're trying to understand where it's coming from? I'm trying to, um, start my own I have I make my own wine and mm -hmm. I was trying to get it um produced and I wanted to get into the spirit um industry but I've traveled to like North Carolina and I've even met with someone that has wine um here and you know they they took my samples 
And I, I learned a lesson later, like you just don't give it because now I know they can do the formula. But I want to know um, if a winery or if someone is not willing to share, you know, how to get your product produced or network you with that person, where can I start? Um, so, and, and, and I want, I want to make sure I'm answering your, your question, the, you know, the, the way it was asked, uh, if you're, you're asking about how a product is distributed or who's distributing a product, um, you know, typically if you, you ask the company, I mean, if you're interested in buying a product and you want to know how to get it, you know, you ask the company, you know, where can I get it or who's your distributor? Usually they're, they're forthcoming with that. Um, you know, if you're trying to find a distributor for your own product, that's, you, you just kind of need to, to try to get a distributor interested and willing to, to distribute it. Now, as far as getting your wine produced at another winery, you're, you're just going to have to talk to a handful of different wineries until you find one, you know, that's, that's willing to do what you want them to do. Uh, it, it's, it, it's really just a, you know, ask around process. Uh, is, what, what, was there something else to your question that I, I missed? I, I guess I, I thought that, you know, maybe it's a listing or like I have um, joined different spirit network um, programs and, you know, when you can send out something, um, introducing yourself, um, most of the time you, you know, I may not, because I know a lot of people are in the industry. Um, I may not get any type of response or if, I'm just asking the simple question, um, who is your uh, producer? So, you know, I can at least network or try to get to that person. Um, so, a lot of people not willing to share. Yeah, I, I, I would suggest um, trying to go through some industry associations. Um, I, 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 I'm not as well tied in on the wine side of the business as I am on the spirit side. Uh, so, so I can't, you know, off the top of my head, give you, you know, three associations in the wine industry, uh, but, but I'm sure they exist and I can do a little research later and, and try to find them. Uh, you know, I would say on the spirit side, some key organizations that could be very helpful and, and they even have chat groups where, where you could like, pose questions to the group and a lot of people are very forthcoming. Um, one is called the American Craft Spirits Association. And if, if, if you Google it, it'll, uh, you know, you, you should find a link to their website. Uh, let me know. I think I might actually have it here. Uh, it's AmericanCraftSpirits.org is their website. Um, there's also a, a group called, uh, uh, the American Distillation Institute or ADI and their website is distilling.com and that's the, the ADI. Uh, and the, the ADI has an open forum where, where you could literally ask a question in a chat group and you'll you know, you'll probably get a response with, you know, recommendations on, on five or six different distilleries who could do something for you if you're, if you're looking on distilleries. And I, I'm pretty sure there's some similar groups um, in the winery community. I, I'm just not tied in with them. Right now. And how can we get in contact with you? Uh, let me put up our contact info again. And, and I think um, Lauren, did you say there's going to be a, an email going out later with a copy of the slides? Yes, we're going to set out an email with a copy of the slides with your information and also an edited recording of this 
presentation. All right, so it shows Scott Amster. Uh, Scott's on the line too. He's our, our head of business development. Uh, he's actually gonna be the, the best contact for you guys. And, and if he needs to refer some questions back to me, uh, he'll do so. But um, you know, our website is ziamidistillery.com. Uh, we've got some more info on our capabilities there. And you could reach Scott, just uh, scott at ziamidistillery.com. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and for your time today. And uh, yeah, that wraps up another episode of Entrepreneur Mind Speak. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for staying extra on the call.